Okay, welcome to uh, another uh, teaching. This one is still on politics and it's still on critical race theory, probably the last one of those. Um, I'm talking about outrage today. Okay, there's an outcry for outrage today, just politically, not just because of critical race theory, but for all sorts of different reasons. And it's on both the left and the right. For critical race theorists and critical theory in general, there's a there's an out, there's a cry for outrage on the grounds that that injustice demands outrage. Here's a quote that says, to be clear, the whole we can disagree and still be friends is for stuff like pineapple on pizza, not the systemic destruction of an entire community. What they're saying is, I can't be friends with you if you disagree with me on, on key aspects of racism or other kinds of oppression. And um, that's not exactly outrage, but it sort of expresses the idea. Critical race theorists are often saying, we've got to be angry angry enough that we're going to separate friendships and refuse to associate with people if they don't agree with us on these fundamental, fundamental issues. Um, one of the reasons they say this, and so I put this in quotes to show that it's their thought, is because systemic sin thrives on apathy. Sins like a robbery or adultery or something thrive on people who go against the, the, the culture and sort of rebel. But systemic sin is almost invisible and hard to stop, and, and it, it thrives on people who don't care. It thrives on indifference. And so critical race theory makes a big deal of saying, don't be indifferent. Don't be um, passive, you have to get angry enough to make a difference, angry enough to insist on something. Also because many changes to the system, they would say, are merely appeasements with the goal of sil silencing critics. It's part of the theory of critical race theory that if the, if the system, if the people who are in charge uh, make concessions about race or about uh, gender or whatever kind of uh, critical theory we're looking at, that you should not trust that as being really in good faith that probably what it really is, is that people are just trying to find a way to appease the, those who are causing trouble so that they'll stop causing trouble and go away. It's sort of like, if, maybe if we just concede this, they'll let it go. And so that means that built into critical race theory is a kind of a suspicion of any attempt at reconciliation, a kind of a suspicion of any attempt to actually um, accept what people are doing in response as changing their minds and sort of repenting and getting things straight. It's sort of this idea that we need to be perpetually angry, perpetually suspicious, perpetually uh, uh, hostile, and t because there's perpetually going to be people trying to be oppressive. On the other hand, those who are opponents of critical race theory also are these days uh, crying out for outrage. Here's an example. This comes from Thomas Aquinas, who lived about 600 years ago, 800 years ago, but it reflects what people are saying today. He is not angry when there's just cause for anger is immoral. Why? Because anger looks to the good of justice. And if you can live amid injustice without anger, you're immoral as well as unjust. He says there's injustice, injustice around. The right response to injustice is to be angry, you need to be angry. If you're not angry, there's something wrong with you morally. Um, so th this is uh, the kind of thing that you hear very often in different forms from um, opponents of critical race theory. They say, if you're not outraged, you really don't recognize how sinful everything is and you need to be more outraged about it. Because they're saying being distressed by sin is the appropriate response. And there is some scripture that kind of hints at that. For example, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Although I'm not sure in the context of Proverbs that that is talking so much about hating everybody else's evil so much as it, as it is about being humble and hating the evil in yourself. Although I think it does apply to hating injustice. Um, or another verse, uh, another idea is because God himself is angry with sin. For example, Psalms says, God judges the righteous and he's angry with the wicked every day in the King James. In, in New American Standard says he's indignant with the wicked. Okay, so these verses are true, but I don't think they mean exactly the same thing as outrage. I think they mean more that we have a settled conviction that sin is wrong and we are angry at the wrongness of sin. And I don't think that has to mean like a the kind of anger that we sometimes are seeing today. I don't think it means the kind of outrage that we're sometimes seeing today. And I think it's important for us to be balanced and biblical about this, both on the critical race theory side and on opponents of the critical race theory as Christians, whichever side we're looking at things at, or whether we're sort of sifting and being in the middle, we need to be careful about understanding uh, the limits of when it's okay to be outraged. Okay, so uh, both sides in this case are wanting people to be angry. Uh, there's a famous, uh, not famous, there's a little quote by Aristotle, says it's harder to fight with pleasure than with anger. And by fight with, he doesn't mean fight against, he means fight 
having it. He's, he's saying if you're pleased, it's hard to fight. If you're angry, it's easy to fight. And he goes on, actually, after this quote to say, but it's better to be able to fight when you're pleased. That takes more nobility. You have to do it for the right reasons. You're not just caught up in the emotion. But the point is, if you're whether you're on one side or the other, if you're kind of extreme on one side or the other, you want people to be whipped up into outrage, into frenzy, into anger as much as you can, uh, because that's it's easier to get people to fight if they're angry than it is to get them to fight if they're just trusting God and and and, and content with where God has them. So there's kind of a, a danger that we're going to ha- let people go us into not being content with God. Um, both sides tend to weaponize offense. Sometimes they make a virtue of being offended by people, and sometimes they make a virtue of offending people. And uh, I will talk about that actually in a couple of weeks, but it's an important aspect of this as well. And sometimes neither side values forgiveness. This is especially true in in the theory of critical race theory. Again, there's kind of a suspicion that the sin is, sin is systemic anyway, not just individuals. So there really isn't anything to any person to forgive. There's kind of an assumption that nobody ever gets better from this. There's no real reconciliation. And so forgiveness as a lot of people see it today, is an affront to justice. We need to be aware of this. 20 years ago, the world told us constantly, you need to not judge, you need to forgive everybody, and don't worry about whether they've repented or anything else. These days, in critical race theory, the world is telling us, judgment, 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 because there's injustice, don't forgive. uh, I remember uh, somebody said, um, posted a meme that said, I was astonished to find that John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, was a slave trader. I can't I can't sing that song anymore or something to that effect. And somebody said, wait a minute. He repented of being a slave trader and he wrote that song saying Amazing Grace. You know, I was such a wretch that I was a slave trader, but now God has forgiven me. And then he fought against the slave trade. They said, it doesn't matter. He was a slave trader. That's enough that it just, you know, cancels him for me. We need to be a little careful about this because the Christian gospel is all about forgiveness. It's all about the fact that there's lots of reasons for outrage against us. And God has canceled that debt against us. He hasn't canceled us. He's canceled the debt and he's brought us forgiveness. And that's the message we bring to every, to all sides in all these conflicts is there's hope for reconciliation, true justice, but justice that comes along with forgiveness. So this is where, why we need to be a little bit important about out, outrage and anger and understanding their place in the Christian life. So the important thing to understand is there's a difference between godly anger and worldly anger. And sometimes we say, well, we're just being angry in a godly way. But if we were really honest in ourselves with ourselves, we're actually being uh, anger, angry in a worldly fleshly way. So uh, Ephesians 4.26 does say, be angry and yet do not sin. That's not a command that says you have to be angry. What it means is in your anger, don't sin. In other words, it's not saying right out that anger is automatically sin, but it is saying, watch out. When you're angry, you're going to be likely to sin. So when you're angry, don't sin. It also goes on to say, don't hold on to your anger. We'll talk, talk about talk about that later. Uh, Psalm 37, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. So this meshes fretting about people who are doing injustice, fretting about people who are carrying out wicked schemes with anger and wrath at them. And it says, if you spend your time fretting over those who are doing injustice and wickedness, it will lead only to evil doing because you're not resting in the Lord. You're fretting about it yourself as though you have to do something about it. You're not waiting patiently for him to bring justice. This isn't saying that we don't care about justice, and that we're not angry in a certain proper sense, but it's saying we're not angry with a fretting and a, and a, and a sense that we have to take matters into our own hands and do what only God can do. Uh, another verse which is really important is that the anger of man, it says, does not achieve the righteousness of God. We feel when we're getting really angry and accomplishing things that we're doing the work of God. But James says flat out, if it's just the anger of man, if it's not from God, even if you can attach it to some God-related goal, if your anger is not from God, if it's from you, from your flesh, from the world, from people drumming it up in you, it will not achieve the righteousness of God. So this is why we need to be careful about this. Again, James 3.18 says the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Um, Both critical race theorists and people on the other side these days in the polarized political environment we're in think that the way to get righteousness, the seed whose whose fruit is righteousness, will be sown in conflict. It will be sown in fighting against people. 
But this explicitly says, if you want to sow the fruit, which the seed which produces the fruit of righteousness, you need to sow it in peace, and you need to be one who makes peace. That doesn't mean we never confront, but we confront in a way that's aiming at peace and reconciliation and forgiveness. We don't confront in a way that's aiming at continual battling. Matter of fact, there's a word pugnacious, which means somebody who wants to fight all the time. And people who are pugnacious, who want to fight all the time, are disqualified from being elders in both 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. It is not a, a godly virtue to always want to be fighting. And uh, sometimes today we be, are being encouraged as Christians by both sides of the political spectrum to be pugnacious, to be fighting everybody. And that's just not biblical. And so... um. Again, there's not that you can't confront, but I. But if my general, the whole tone of my life is that I'm spending all my time wanting to fight everybody, then then I'm I'm just exhibiting a characteristic which the scripture does not approve of, and it calls me away from. Okay, so let's think about God's anger, because God is definitely sometimes angry, according to scripture. The thing to notice is that God is slow to anger and quick to forgive. We tend to be quick to anger and slow to forgive. And those two things make a big difference. And that's one of the things we can really work at is how can we learn to be slower to anger and quicker to forgive? So let's look at the slow to anger first. Um, God is, this is one of the most important characteristics of God. In the Old Testament, it has a few places where God defines his character for people. And in many places, he says he's slow to anger. This is the most important. Exodus 34. He says, this is as he, God, Moses said, show me your glory. And he said, I'll show you my glory. And he passed by in front of him and he said, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he'll be not, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. He does talk about wrath and punishment and judgment here. But notice that one of the things he says is, I may be angry at sin, but I'm slow to anger. I'm slow to anger. And he repeats that a bunch of places. Every one of these verses I just put on the screen, he repeats this in one form or another. It says, God is slow to anger. Um, here's another bunch of verses you can look up if you, if you want to later that talk about the need for us to be slow to anger in imitation of God. Um, we are those who wait for justice. Again, it does not mean we don't care about justice. It doesn't mean we don't have a kind of an anger at sin and injustice in the sense that we realize that it is wrong that it is here. What it means is that we're waiting. We're willing to trust God in the meantime. James 5 says, um, to, says to those who are suffering, it says, wait like a farmer waits for his crops to grow or for the brains to come. God will eventually judge. God will eventually deliver. And you need to just be patient like Job was. In the end, God will make everything right. In the end, he will solve injustice. So if you're angry at racism, you can speak out against it. You can work against it. But mainly, you have to wait for God to bring justice. If you're angry at people you think are going to excess uh, trying to fight racism, you can, you can be angry about what you see as the injustice, but you need to wait patiently for God to respond. This is so hard for us to do. Luke 18 is the picture of the woman who, in, who goes to a judge and asks for justice and he's not giving it to her. And Jesus says he told, it says he, Jesus taught us that to teach us to pray and keep having faith and not give up on our prayers because sooner or later God will answer our cries for justice and bring justice because God, unlike the unjust judge, is holy and righteous and cares about us. But we are people who pray and wait. Uh, Matthew 5, 1 through 12 talks about being in the kingdom and says, and gives the beatitudes. And those beatitudes are not not pictures of somebody who's out fighting belligerently at everything. They're pictures of people who are meekly and humbly waiting for God to act, speaking out, willing to be persecuted, willing to suffer for the sake of righteousness, but not fighting everybody, rather being, um, and not being angry in a certain sense, rather being uh, humble and meek and accepting our suffering. Romans 12 says, don't ever take your own revenge, leave room for the wrath of God. Let him do the judging and the revenge taking. And over and over throughout scripture, we exhorted to have meekness and gentleness and humility and tenderness and patience. One of the words used for patience is, in some versions is long suffering, willing to keep suffering for a long time before we get angry because we're slow to anger. All right, this is hard. I'm not saying I do uh, better than you guys. It's it's tough, but it's important for us to recognize this is the scriptural standard. 
not that we don't confront, not that we don't want to see injustice stopped, but that we're not, it's not up to us to make it, ha- to make it happen right now. Um, it's also important to recognize the distance between difference between anger, which is to, can be developed slowly, and temper, which is to not have control over my own response, to just get to fly out of control. Look at these verses in Proverbs about temper. He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick tempered exalts folly. So it's one thing: am I angry? It's another thing: am I spurred to anger really quickly? He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit, then he who captures a city is saying it is hard to rule your spirit. It is hard to be slow to anger because it's harder to control your own spirit than it is to capture a whole city. But you're better than the mighty when you learn to do that. It's great spiritual strength when you when we learn to do that. He who restrains his words has knowledge and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. In other words, this is talking about the words you want to blurt out when somebody angers you and it's saying, don't lose your temper respond coolly. That's the, that's the way of understanding. Like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man has, and who has no control over his spirit. If I have a city that's without walls, anybody can run in and conquer it at any time. If I have no control over my spirit, I can be doing all sorts of things for Jesus and all Satan has to do is trigger me and he can throw me off completely and sort of conquer me spiritually for a moment. So we, we want to learn to have control over our spirits. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. So the way of wisdom, it isn't that we never are angry. It's never that we never are even outraged in a sense over injustice, but we're never quick tempered. We're never out of control. And that's important. We also need to be quick to forgive. Uh, One key to this is to remember who the enemy is. Ephesians 6, we've looked at before. It says we we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against against principalities and powers, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our enemy is the devil. 2 Timothy says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. You do correct them with gentleness. Why? Well, it says, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. We look at somebody who's doing all sorts of horrible things, and we think they are the enemy. Timothy, uh, Paul says to Timothy, they're not the enemy, they're victims of Satan. Satan is the enemy. So have patience with them, pray for them, correct them, but correct them lovingly, hoping that they will come to repentance one day and escape from the snare they've fallen into. That's why in Ezekiel, or part, related to this, in Ezekiel, God says, As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? So as we think about injustice, we need to think about those who are causing the injustice and want them to find repentance and joy and and redemption in Christ. We can hate the sin, in other words, and love the sinner. No matter how much the world tells us we can't do that, we can do that. We can hate the sin and love the sinner, and that's exactly how we ought to respond. Love the people who are caught up in the sin, even while we're praying for them to repent and speaking out against what they're doing, if, if that's what's appropriate. Uh, Luke 15, Jesus was constantly running into problems with this with the Pharisees. They were upset that he was so easily offering salvation and forgiveness to people who'd been sinning for a long time. Luke 15 is a series of parables saying, look, if, if a woman finds a lost coin, she's delighted to find it. If a, if a shepherd finds a lost sheep, he's delighted to find it. And when a father's prodigal son comes back, he's delighted that he's back. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, I don't want to, I'm not looking to punish everybody who's been sinning. I'm wanting to bring them back to God. I'm wanting to, them to repent. And when they do, I am delighted with that. I have the same heart as the Father who's rejoicing that they've come back. Um, Matthew 21 is a parable where he says, look, if somebody says, I'm going to obey, and then later they don't, is that really obedience? But on the other hand, if somebody says, I'm not going to obey, but later they change their mind and do, which one of those does God really approve of? The second one. It's not where you start. It's where you end up. You can be doing all sorts of horrible things, and if God touches your heart and you are drawn to to repentance and you, you repent and you call out for God for mercy and forgiveness, that is enough. That's something that we can rejoice in. First Timothy 1 is Paul talking about, I was such a horrible sinner. I was trying to put get Christians put to death, and yet God has 
has had mercy on me and sh- given me this great ministry. And that's partly to show everybody how great his mercy is. Um, one thing that somebody, sometimes people ask is they ask, what about Jesus? And they ask the question, are we supposed to be nice? You hear a lot of people today saying, we're not called to be nice. We're called to speak truth boldly. Um, and they say, Jesus wasn't nice. He was really rough. And there's two passages they quote to point that out. And they're both true, but they're not the whole story. Matthew 23, Jesus launches on a big diatribe, just really is really tough on what he says about the Pharisees. And then in Mark 11 and parallel passages, he cleanses the temple. Now, next week, I'm going to spend the entire week on the cleansing the temple story, and we'll talk about that. But there is no doubt Jesus did that, maybe twice, I think twice. And in Matthew 23, he definitely speaks harshly against the Pharisees. But sometimes people talk as though this is the main way Jesus responded. And it is not. Mostly you see pictures of him being tender and, and, and gentle. And he, and he says things to that. He was kind, gentle, and meek. He was also confrontational, but he was kind, gentle, and meek. Here's a, here's an interesting verse where it's a prophecy from Isaiah that's quoted by Matthew about Jesus dealing with the, with the crowds. It says, he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. It's talking about crying out in anger, crying out in outrage, that there should be more justice. It says, a battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out. If there's people who are just barely hanging on, their fire is just about to go out, he won't put it out. He'll nurture it and be tender with it until he leads justice to victory. So he's bringing justice, but he's bringing it partly through his gentleness and his tenderness. That's partly about Jesus. So should we be nice? I don't know what the word nice means, but I know we are supposed to be kind. We are supposed to be gentle. We are supposed to be meek. We are supposed to be humble. We are supposed to be tender. Those kinds of things we are supposed to be. That seems nice to me. If you want to call it something else, that's fine. But don't let the 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 couple of verses about Jesus being angry make you feel like we're always supposed to be angry at everybody everywhere we go. That's not the primary idea we're supposed to, or the thing we're supposed to live by. So what if you struggle with anger? Because I think a lot of us struggle with anger in different ways. Um, here's some things I suggest. First of all, no matter what it is, anger is tough. It's tough to overcome. And so the first thing you have to do, like everything else, is you have to trust God for this. It's not up to you by yourself to change your life. That's God's um, promise to you that he will be working to sanctify you. And so the first thing you do is you put yourself back in God's hands and say, God, you're going to have to change this in my life because I'm not going to be able to do it on my own. Secondly, is to recognize the dangers of anger. Um, anger is a gateway sin. Uh, Ephesians 4 says, don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. I think the idea here is that if you hold on to your anger, it gives the devil opportunities to bring other sins into your life. There's some sins that are gateway sins in the same way that there's certain drugs that are gateway drugs. A gateway drug is one that is not so dangerous in and of itself, but if you take it, it tends to lead you to bigger drugs, worse, worse drugs. A gateway sin, as I'm defining, is a sin that may not seem so bad on its own, but it leads you to other sins. So like, for example, it says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And it means that if you love money, it leads you to all sorts of other sins for the sake of the money. And this is saying, if you are angry and hold on to that anger and don't let go of it, don't let it pass, don't let God deal with it, that anger becomes an opportunity, a, a foothold for God to get in your, for Satan to get in your life and to draw you into other sins. And part of the reason for that is anger is very self-justifying. When we feel angry, part of the emotion is to feel that we are not at fault. And so if I'm feeling angry enough, I can find myself doing and saying things I would normally not say because my anger is telling me, you're in the right. You can say this. You can do this. It's not your fault. So anger is a a dangerous place for us to be because we let it draw us into other sins. Um, I think it's helpful if you're angry at something to look. Often when I'm angry, there's an underlying other emotion. I'm afraid. And that fear is turning into anger for me. Or I'm very sad about something and that sorrow is turning into anger for me. If I can recognize why I'm angry and say I'm angry because I'm afraid or I'm angry because I'm guilty or I'm angry because I'm sorrowful and recognize that and just bring that emotion out into the open and be honest with God about that, often I find the anger fades. Um, Mainly we need to lean into waiting for God to deal with injustice in his own time. And finally, one more thing. Maybe if you struggle a lot with anger, you should avoid angry peers. Look at this verse from Proverbs. Don't associate with a man given anger, 
or go with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. So here's my suggestion. If you find that certain social media triggers you, if you find that watching certain news programs triggers you to anger, maybe Proverbs is telling you, you should stop associating with those things. Don't listen to those channels. Don't watch those, uh, don't follow that social media. Don't hang around with those people all the time. Instead, try to find things that will help you fight the battle against anger. Okay, I'll leave that to you in your own conscience of however God leads you. Uh, next week, I would like to talk about Jesus cleansing the temple. The week after that, I'd like to talk about offending and being offended, which is closely related to what we just talked about here. But I'm not going to focus on critical race theory. I'm just going to focus on the general political atmosphere. And finally, after that, we're going to move into a series of, of, of teachings on sweetness of speech. Proverbs says that the wise man learns to sweeten his speech to be persuasive. And we're in an era where political people on both sides are telling us we need to be very harsh in our speech and just rail against people. And that's not biblical either. So I want to show you that in scripture, try to convince you that it's in, the, it's in scripture. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, thanks. Uh, see you later.